of his wrath. wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Now, number six takes us all the way to the end. Number six is working with 18, 19, and 20 of Revelation. So now watch what seven says. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds. He went all the way up past Jesus and in the latter day now. All right, what they do? The four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, if you went to chapter 9, verse 4, it'll support it. Now, these four angels represented the end of the world. And the Lord is going to hold it back. Now, remember, this is after the Lamb came. Correct? Yeah. So this can't be the Israel of old who had lost their covenant. This couldn't be the original tribe of Israel who he wiped out except for a remnant of Judah. Because they are already gone. This is already after it. And Jesus came to his own and his own what? Received, Received him, not. him not. He said, I did not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. So he was looking for Judah. And he said, Judah had scattered themselves throughout the world. Israel. So this was after the other tribes were already gone except Judah and Dan. What does it go on to say? And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, which is the six-pointed star in the crescent that was sighted in the year 1970 when they came together. Elijah Muhammad spoke about it. All of them spoke about when the crescent and the star comes together, and it did. Okay, what happened? And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. He called out this angel, Mikhail, in 1970 and told the angels, Hold back the wind. Don't destroy the world yet. Why? Go ahead. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants, Abdullah, of our God in their foreheads. Now, Muslims are the only ones getting a seal on their foreheads who are servants of Allah. When we call ourselves Abdullah, we say we are servants of Allah, all Muslims. And by prostration, they get the mark on their forehead by consequence of prostration. Then the other ones get the mark of the beast in their palm of their hand on their forehead. But these are not talking about the mark of the beast. This is talking about the mark of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for righteousness. Because it calls them the servants, right? Yeah. This is in the latter day, after 1970. Go ahead. Four. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And what? And there were sealed... 144,000 of all the, all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now watch how they start off. Of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Why they pick Judah first? He's the last one. Because that's the one tribe that Jesus was coming for. I did not come unto the Lord's sheep of the house of Israel only. I am of Judah, the lion's wealth, etc., etc., etc. Judas was not the first son of Jacob. Judas was the fourth son of Jacob. Why didn't they start with the first son and come on down like they do in the books of Genesis? Because this is not talking to the old tribe of Israel. This is a stereotype of Israel. And they're also going to leave out certain names that are of the original tribes and add in Ephraim and Manasseh. They're going to add names that wasn't even there. Because remember, Joseph went to Egypt and married Egyptian women and had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And their name is going to end up in here. And they wasn't even there when Jacob gave the covenant to Israel about Judah and the Shiloh. They had nothing to do with it. Go ahead. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi. And Levi was not one of the tribes. He was one of the sons, but it was considered the priesthood. And was not classified a tribe, so they shouldn't be here. The priesthood of Aaron was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun was sealed 12,000. What else? The tribe of Joseph. Of the tribe of Joseph. Joseph was not a tribe. Joseph is the one who went down and lived in Egypt when all the other tribes were living in the land of Canaan and they had to come to Egypt for the famine. He wasn't even a tribe. 
How can Joseph be there and his son? And of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000. Now watch. After this happened, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all the nations and kindreds of people, and all the tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white Rose. and palm leaves. If they are the tribe of Israel, and they see that, why are they wearing just the opposite color instead of white robes? Because this is a stereotype of Israel. And Revelation 5, 9 and verse 14 will reiterate it. Go to Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. That's the seals we're talking about. Well, who are they? Let's go back and see. Number five, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in the heavens nor in the earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, what? Neither the seal thereof. This is not Revelation. This is in Revelation. <laughs> This can't be the book of Revelation they're talking about because it's in it. And I wept much, John says, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look therein. And one of the elders said unto me, ask the Christians who were the elders. They don't even speak about the elders, the masters. They don't even know anything about them. But the Bible speaks about the elders. The Quran calls them the Awalina, the first ones, the ancient ones. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold what? The lion of the tribe, the lion of, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. He had won. He did not die. He did not get crucified. He had prevailed. Jesus prevailed to do what? To open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. You see? All of it links. Then it goes right back down to that. As I told you, if you went through that whole chapter, you'd see the whole story of Jesus unmasked. All of these scriptures are talking about a kind of Israel. They're not talking about the tribe of Israel who had lost their covenant. They're talking about when Jesus came and he came to Israelites to save the tribe of Judah and they rejected him and persecuted him and scorned him and spat on him and betrayed him and delivered him up. And he also separated them from the other ones. He said, I know the blasphemy of them who call themselves Jews and are not. They are the synagogues of Satan. Their bodies are temples in which Satan lives. You understand? Yeah. So when you go to the names of all the 12 tribes and you compare them back to Genesis, you'll begin to see how this could not be talking about them. This is in the future. It'll go on. It says, number nine. After this I beheld in lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations. Not of all the nation of Israel, of all nations. Why? Because it tells you in Acts that his people were scattered throughout the world speaking all kind of tongues. In that room right there you have Spanish, English, you have different languages that the real tribe of Israel is now speaking. If you went to Germany, you'll find black people there speaking German. If you went to Korea, you'll find black people there speaking Korean. The tribe of Judah, the original seed, is scattered throughout the world. We must be gathered or come hither again, it says. Because the iniquities of the Amorites are not yet filled. We must regather, re-speak our language, like Isaiah 52 says. Put back on our garbs of righteousness, our pure garb, the garb of the bride. Prepare ourselves for the wedding. The wedding is symbolic in the scripture of the coming. If you read Matthew 22, you see the whole symbolism of the coming of the new city of Jerusalem. Matthew 21, 22 is matching right up with Revelation 21, 22. When the wedding is prepared, how will they be dressed? It says in the bridegroom, white veils, white dresses, and long white robes, preparing themselves as the 144,000 are prepared. And you have to be raised first so that you can give birth to the children who are pure virgins, who have not been mixed or diluted or touched by the hands of Satan. You have to give birth to them. Why are you wobbling around the streets, messing around in kappa clothes and dreads and African garments and all kinds of things that are paganistic that you want to call culture because you're starving for your culture. You're letting your real culture pass you by. I remember being told throughout the years that there was part of the Bible missing. 
that part of the Bible was missing. I would like to know if part of the Bible is missing, what part is missing, and when was it discovered, and is there any proof that there's part of this Bible that's missing? If you have a pencil and paper, I'll give you about four or five places in the Bible where they mention books that if you look in the index, you won't find. Okay? They have their names. If someone, maybe somebody will write it down for you. All right? Okay. If, uh... You ready? Yes, I'm ready. If you look in the books of Numbers 21, 14, can somebody read that? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wherefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea. And Here we got mention of a book of the war, the book of war. And if you look throughout your index, you won't find a book in the Bible called the book of war. All right? But yet it's mentioned in the Bible. If we go to, I'm just going to touch them shortly so you can run right through them. If we go to Exodus 24, 7. And he took the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant is mentioned. And that's not in here anywhere. And then book of Kings 2, 22, 8 also mentions the book of law. While you're looking for that one, you can turn to Joshua 10:13. Okay. Okay. Nevertheless, he saved, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his, his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as though the wilderness, as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. All of these are relating to Numbers 21, 14 about that book of wars. Samuel 2, I told you about 18. Exodus 17, 14, 16. Joshua 10, 13. Go to that one. Okay. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jashir? That's a book called Jashir in the Bible that they don't have in an index. Then if you go to the book of Chronicles, the 12th chapter, the 15th verse, they're going to speak of another book called Shemaria. Now the acts of the Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of the Shemala, the prophet? Shemaria, the prophet. So here's a bunch of books mentioned by name in the Bible that if you turn to the index of any of your Bibles, you won't find these books. The question is, where are they? And what did they say that we need to know? Or why were they taken out? You see what I'm saying? But they're right in the Bible. A whole bunch of names. I just gave them. There's more. I'm just going to stop. There's bunches of books mentioned that you will not find in your King James Bible or in your St. Jerome's or your Catholic Bible. They just took them out. And they lost them, they think. Okay? One day I'll explain to you all in a book called out of scriptures tampered with where these books are and what they contained all right but, but for the time being it's a good question for you all to put on the other people as to where are they because they tell you the bible is complete i heard a minister tell somebody the bible was totally complete okay okay thank you you're welcome This is from the 66th verse of the Holy Quran, the 8th verse. And read, O oh, Sustainer, complete for us our light. And forgive us, for surely you have the power over all things. When you start seeing the sending of doves on the cathedral walls or in the stained glass when you see Christ riding an ass and they'll identify that icon as a form of paganism. In the Judaic doctrine, they use the word goyim, which means a Gentile, someone who is not a reader of the Tanakh or the Torah. And that translates again as a form of paganism to them. But it's the wrong meaning and has nothing whatsoever to do with the Bible. There's no Egyptians who are not pagans. Other than the fact that they live in the rural area, they live in the deserts, they live in a part of the Nile, and that can apply to us down in Georgia, 
or us down in small cities versus those living up in Atlanta or up in New York or in Chicago or in California in those, those cities of melting pots of evil like Sodom and Gomorrah. We would therefore, by the definition in the dictionary, be pagan, but it had nothing to do with our religious belief or our, the doctrine or the practices under which we live. Okay? So paganism has nothing to do with animal worship? Paganism has nothing whatsoever to do with animal worship according to a dictionary and a definition, right? But according to religious fanatics who want to stamp certain stereotypes on people because they can't explain certain facts. They have to deal with, when you go to the Bible, for instance, you have to deal with the fact that the word for Egypt is Mizraim. Right? And that word, can you trace that name out in Genesis from son to father, from son to father, from father to son, to father to son, you can find out, like I said earlier, that the Egyptians themselves are in fact of the blood of God. When you go, you go from God or the Elohim to Yahweh according to the Bible in Genesis, by the time you get down past Adam and Eve, and then you get down to that third son, Seth, and then when Seth, the next most prominent character becomes Enoch, and then the next most prominent character becomes Noah of the flood, and then the next most prominent character becomes Abraham, when you go between Abraham and Noah, and you end up in Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, and it says there, And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Foot and Canaan. When you get to that son, Mizraim, Mizraim to them was an Egyptian. Now, how about Ham? The Egyptians have a word called Hem, means black skin or dark people. Now, many people refer to ancient Egypt as Kemet. Many people refer to blacks in America in a derogatory way years ago as a cursed seed of Ham. They were saying black were cursed, and then this became big, and here became not big by the curse, and that's recognized out of Genesis 9.25. But you don't find it mentioning a curse on Ham. It says, Cursed be Canaan, which is a son of Ham. But now when you go into the Bible, you look again into uh, Psalms uh, 105. Can someone read that? 105 verse 23. Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Right in that verse, you got that Israel came into Egypt. If you look in the Hebrew there, you find the word Mitzrayim. And then he said what? Read the verse again. Israel also came into Egypt. Mitzrayim. And Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. So Ham and Mitzrayim are the same people. And that goes back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 6 again. And the sons of Ham are Cush. Cush is Ethiopia. And Midian, Egypt. And Foot, Libya. And Canaan. And Ham is right there. Ham is the father of this sea. So if Ham followed the Egyptians, and Noah, who God chose as a family to survive the flood, who God said should be fruitful and multiply, and he heard the earth again. Noah, who we learned the story of the ark and all the animals, God spoke directly to Noah, and Noah's son was Ham, and Ham fathered Midianites, that puts the Midianites or the Egyptians, and the Hamites, and the Cushites, and the Ethiopians, and the original Libyans, not the ones that's in Libya now who are Italians who invaded, but the dark skinned, woolly haired, original inhabitants of that land, that makes them the seed of God. That makes them the blood of God. That makes them when God said, I think a man in my image and after my likeness, and we go back to Genesis chapter 2, we find the word Ethiopia inside there as a place where God was said the best gold came out of. That says these people, these Ethiopians, these Egyptians, these Muslimites, these Kushites, these Footites, these were all dark skinned, woolly haired people. These were Negro people, and they were the blood of God. Stay on the fact, look at the Bible, look into the Bible, look into the words of the Bible, look into it word by word, translate, get dictionaries, encyclopedias, go to the computer, get logos, Bible, online Bible, and look for yourself. And let the Bible speak to you, directly to you, so you can communion with God yourself. And you won't have the problem of thinking those Egyptians were other than the Hebrews or other than the Israelites. Because as we explained earlier, Hebrews was not a tribe or a race or a religion. Hebrew was an act. The man who found the Hebrew called Abraham, his real name was Abram. It's in the Bible, his name was changed to Abraham. In Genesis 17, And he was a Chaldean, so he changed his name so he would trace it back to a Chaldean name. The Chaldean's language was a form of cuneiform. Cuneiform was a way script, a hieroglyphic script which they found in ancient Egypt first. When God took Adam and moved him eastward 
into the garden, he's moving out of Africa and over in to Asia, over into Jerusalem. So you say, Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Yes, because that's where you germinated your religious beliefs. But your seed originated in Africa. And the intellect of the world is founded in ancient Egypt. The Babylonian deity Tammuz that you find mentioned in the books of Ezekiel that the children of the women of Israel go out and pray and call on this Sumerian deity was a link directly to Anu. And Anu from the Egyptian is Anu with two names and it comes from Heliopolis, the city of the sun. So our acknowledgement and our sense of reality tells us that the deity we've been worshiping as the most high God, the most high or the highest is none other than Ray or the sun called Shemesh in ancient Babylon, called Ray in ancient Egypt, and we say sun in Malachi, the sun of our righteousness, that you man, giving warmth, giving life, giving vitality, the sustainer. That was a symbol that God represented as a circle in his eye, as the all-seeing eye who looks down over all humanity. The sun is not God. The sun is one of God's creations that represent the power of God. So the Egyptians are in fact, when you read your Bible, of the same bloodline, nothing new, not a new race, not a new tribe, not a new family, but of a direct line from Noah to that sun midline. Check it out, don't believe me. Now the question should be, where did they go wrong? And how did they go wrong? How is it that they don't appear from the look on looker to be worshiping the same God the same way? And that there you'll find if you look in Isaiah 1914. You'll find out where a group of 